right. We're good to go. Thank you for joining us. This is Our Revolution Washington Bernie Kratz Coalition vetting interview of Eric Holt for Clark County. Uh, say it again. Clark County <laughs> Council. Clark County Council Chair. Chair. Council yeah. Chair. Well, that's a big one. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your area or office that you're running for? Sure. Uh, as you said, my name is Eric Holt. I'm running for the Clark County Council Chair. And uh, I live in Hawkinson, Washington, which is a rural area of Clark County. I have uh, a wife and, and three boys on a little five acre spot with a bunch of chickens, geese, uh, dogs, cow, goats, and uh, we grow a lot of our own food. And I'm running for the council because uh, right now our council is 100% uh, Republican, which, uh, you know, that's not to say that's something wrong. It's just saying that we're not getting fair representation for the Democrats and the progressives in the area. And we need a voice. We're tired of uh, voting for the lesser of two evils. We want to vote for somebody who we do believe in. And it's sort of like writing a book where where uh, you you write the book because you always read some or you want you want to read something that you truly want to believe in. It's the same thing with people you vote for. You finally end up being the candidate when you can't find that candidate that you truly believe in that you resonate your core values with. And and so um, my core values are are progressive. And and I'm the vice chair of the Washington State Progressive uh, uh, Caucus uh, for the Western Region. Um, I was a, a delegate for, for Bernie Sanders. I uh, ran in 2016 in a very conservative area uh, against the incumbent Republican, and I got uh, almost 40% of the vote. So there are a lot of really progressive voices in Clark County who want to be heard and they want to be represented. And, and um, I'm really excited to be in this position to do that. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for joining us and for running. And then uh, what are some, uh, besides being completely Republican run, uh, what are the challenges of the people in your district? Well, for right now, we have absolutely no leadership on the council, which is why I'm running for chair. With my experience in business and, and in uh, uh, leadership management organizations, I can bring leadership to the council where we can actually effectively uh, cause change. We can bring a, a vision and a mission and we can follow it through and have an agenda and, and actually succeed as a county and, and progress into the future rather being stuck in a holding pattern. Right now, we don't have a, a functioning animal control. We don't have code enforcement. And as a county, your job, you're, in, you're, you, you're, you're the arm of the state and they are putting power and grants to the counties to provide services to the cities and to the residents within those counties. And we're not providing those services. And so we're failing as our job as a county. So the council's failing in their position. And, and it's and frankly for a county of nearly 450,000 people and a budget of nearly a billion dollars, we are not doing what we are getting paid to do. Wow, thank you. Uh, Rhonda likes to start off with <laughs> yes. questions. Well, I, I actually know that Eric has signed on to it, but uh, one of the things I always hit on first is represent us, the American Anti-Corruption Act, mm -hmm. um, which I believe I did see that you did endorse that um, yep. and sent that into our group. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, yeah. Within that, there's a lot of wonderful, beautiful things that we can work on to take democracy back uh, to the people. Um, one thing that is being looked at and really um, on the forefront is like ranked choice voting or a scored voting system. Um, how do you feel about that? And um, what is your idea? What do you think would be kind of a good way to go to open it up to more people? Well, I think ranked choice is, is a fantastic option because we're never going to get to a place in America. And, and frankly, we don't have the infrastructure for multi-party systems. It, it, the, at, the, at the federal level, we're strangling out any real ability for other parties to get engaged and to have real, uh, real ability to, to affect change. So at the local level, if we start to do ranked choice voting, you actually have people of any, any kind of party who have the ability to have fair representation based on their ideas and not on their alignments. 
and that I think is the most uh, important part of, of representation of people is not on your affiliation with any particular party, it's your ability to lead and what you bring to the table. Excellent, so Vancouver, uh, actually in their chapter, um, they did pass ranked choice voting at one point, but our um, uh, voting, the way we count them, um, whatever, need to be upgraded. My mind goes blank every now and again on name, on words. But um, uh, they need to be updated, and I think that's a county thing. So um, uh, you would be in favor then of updating the uh, machines. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, the machines uh, yes. to be able to, because uh, that's what we're going to have to do, is we're going to have to convince a council um, yeah. to do so. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, within the American Anti-Corruption Act, yeah, you the, have signed on the, to it. Go ahead. I think he's stuck. There you go. Go ahead. Well, I was just I was going to say I was going to say that the uh, the county elections department is currently in its testing phase of four different new software programs. Volunteers come down to the elections office observers to uh, to uh, look into that software. So I don't know if if any of those contain the ability for ranked choice, but I sure hope so. And I, I think it's something we should probably look into. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And then within the, within the American Anti-Corruption Act, when you looked it over, what really stood out that like, yes, this is what, what I want to get behind? Anything in particular? Well, I, I mean, everything. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I want to take out Citizens United. I want big money out of politics. I want corruption out of, out of all politics. It's what motivated me, motivated me to get involved in the very beginning was the fact that our only choices were choices that weren't, um, they didn't hold the same core values that I did. And, you know, after running a, a couple of elections now, a couple of campaigns, I understand that you do have to raise money to get your message out. Anybody does, any nonprofit does, any, you know, anytime you're trying to get anything done, you have to be able to get that message out. You can get so much done through people and volunteers and through social media, but there's, there is money that has to be raised. So I get it. But, it doesn't have to be hundreds of millions of dollars. It doesn't, for, for a county race that pays somebody $50,000 a year, you don't need to raise a quarter million dollars to, to it, it's, it's purely uh, corruption at that point because you're buying radio ads, you're buying TV ads, you're sending mailers, you're creating so much trash and, and waste uh, that doesn't actually benefit society. All it does is spread a, a false narrative. So I definitely want to, uh, I, you know, I'm a big supporter of getting, of getting corruption and money out of politics. So are you in favor of then um, a publicly funded, publicly run elections then where we have a set date, set time, set amount of money, that's all you get to do with it what you can? Yes, I know, because what happens is the established uh, parties benefit from that because they all they all hit their limits. But then any party who hasn't reached a certain uh, fundraising level and ha and isn't considered a qualifier for that, those people get knocked out because they don't get the same uh, representation. So I, I, I do support public finance of, of campaigns, but it needs to be fair across the board for any right. party that wants to be part of that. Exactly. Yes, uh, that would be in mind, yes, that to be equal uh, across boards. Thank you, that was my main point. Um, Courtney now has a list that we go through um, where we talk about either publicly, if something should be publicly funded or should be privately kind of funded or, or ran. So we're gonna let Courtney take this piece over. All right. All right. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so as she said, uh, should it be a privatized service or a publicly funded service? and or, or at least have a publicly funded option within the market. So uh, I, you might have tipped on some of this already, but uh, healthcare? Healthcare should be uh, all public. Okay, postal service? Uh, it's, it does fantastic as a public service. Schools? Schools should definitely be public. Okay, prisons? Prisons should definitely be public and should be abolished, but for the most heinous crimes. Excellent. So um, the distribution and investment of social security? That should definitely be public. As you get more transparency. There you go. Foster care? Should be public. 
child care? That should be publicly provided. Utilities? And, and to, to clarify on the publicly, publicly funded daycare, it should be charged back to corporations as a benefit, but it should be uh, ran and, and uh, funded by, by, the, by the state. Oh, that's wonderful. So corporations, as part of your as part of your pay benefit package, would be your pay, your your you know your your pension, uh, your your vacation, but and your daycare, but not provided only subsidized through this the corporations. Oh, if that if that's clear. Yeah, very and awesome. That's a awesome a no. wonderful clarification. Thank you. Um, uh, mm. Utilities like water, garbage, sewer, um, electricity. Well, I, Clark. Clark County is a perfect example that that uh, public utilities are the way to go. We have the lowest rates in the state, and we have some of the highest uh, customer service levels in the entire nation. So definitely, if we're using a model like Clark Public Utilities, this is the way to do it. Excellent. Tacoma's got some public utilities, too. I love it. Um, internet and cell service, are they considered utilities in that uh, area in that same way? Uh, no, they're private, but they should be. I mean, so the the, the broadband, the, the airwaves, belong to the people of the, of America. Even though for the last forty years there's been attack on on our ownership of that, and so uh, as we continue continue to allow more and more expansion of broadband access and ISPs, we're losing that grasp and, and control as a people. And uh, net neutrality is a huge part of keeping that fair and balanced, whereas the further privatization of our airwaves is a direct attack on our freedoms, and I don't support it. Excellent. Um, public lands and natural resources. Should most definitely be public. Okay. Uh, banks? Banks should definitely be public. I mean, if, if uh, Washington opened a state bank and then all of the uh, all of the bonds and all of the local governments operated through that, we could actually rate, uh, lower the, the, the bond ratings and the taxes for the people who live here because we'd be benefiting from our own investment, from investing in us as a, as a people rather than corporations. Excellent. Uh, mass transit from buses and ferries, railways and airways? Definitely public because you can do it so much more efficiently as an umbrella uh, a per service provider like a county does than if you're a private company who is going to look at the cheapest rates, uh, wages, looking at cutting benefits anytime they're not making the profit levels. I mean, if, if there was a, a, a nonprofit who wanted to provide service to some, some ways like, like uh, homeless shelters and whatnot, they're going to generally be subsidized through the government anyway. And so what, no matter what you do, as long as you've got it running efficiently, the government is going to provide a better access and a, and a better, more fair and more equitable product. Excellent. Uh, infrastructure. Infra infrastructure is definitely uh, financed by the, the government. And um, when we do partner with with people to, do, to, to build infrastructure, because you don't want to have a permanent... Uh, a permanent force on standby to fix roads or to build a bridge and then lay them off until the next one's needed. So you want to contract with companies who are efficient and able to do that and they do it full time. But you want to make sure that when you do, you protect rights of the workers and make sure it's it's good paid union work. And then because uh, you're going to get a better quality of work when you use union workers. And uh, and so I think that I, I see that as a collaboration between private and public. Excellent. Uh, and then military and its associated industrial complex. Well, I think that military, I, I uh, am deeply grateful for all the service members who go into the service and, 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 uh, and serve our country together. Um, but I think our military industrial con complex is incredibly bloated and uh, we do not need to be the world police. We don't need to be 12 times larger than the next uh, investing company or uh, country. And so I think if we were to take a huge portion of what we bloat into our d uh, defense system and reinvest it into education and uh, healthcare and uh, just every other thing that we could be spending that money on, we would be in a world where you don't need to police the world. 
Lovely. Uh, and the Veterans Administration. The Veterans Administration is a is a great uh, 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 it's a great service provided by the, the the United States for our veterans, and and it should stay as such. Excellent. Uh, scientific. Although, I, sorry, go ahead. If I could clarify, though, I would like to see the VA and Medicaid and Medicare all wrapped into one universal health care provided service, so that all people get the same le level of care that our congressmen and senators do and our, our, uh, the people who have served our country. If we did it properly, we could run it at probably a $200 billion a year less than what we're currently spending just on Medicaid and VA, just by changing the infrastructure and, cha and taking the private entities out of it. Wonderful. Um, and then scientific funding. Do you think the government- Oh, definitely. It's Oh, definitely. Because once you once you put into um, well, so it's it's split. It depends on who is running the government. Because if you have people who are anti-science running the government, they're going to defund the programs they don't like, and they're not going to and they're they're only going to fund the things that that sustain their belief system. But on the other side, if you only have corporations funding. Uh, and research and, and science, then you're only going to get what they can profit most from, and those who suffer the most in society will not get uh, the, their needed uh, coverage. So I could see that as a collaborative effect. Allow corporations to make the investments where they see fit on a, on a uh, probably a, a cap of, of what they can do to charge people, and then allow the government to, to focus on those less profitable entities so that it's benefit society as a whole. And that collabor collaboration together uh, could probably work. And it, it's, it's, it's what we are using right now uh, for the most part, except for that our pharmaceutical companies don't have that cap. They're allowed to just charge exorbitant fees and, and keep profiteering and hold those patents, even though they have to adhere to other uh, rules in other countries, they don't have to do that in ours. Yeah, I think when this uh, scientific funding um, aspect got added to our uh, list, some of the concern was uh, corporations do research that, um, and then they cherry pick their, what they release. They're not obligated to release all the studies. So they might do 50 studies on a single medication, but they only release the two that makes them look good. And then um, mm -hmm. another aspect that people complained about with that is um, the, the studies that the government does fund then are sold to the highest bidder who then can, makes the billions off of it and do, don't have sales caps. So caps and maybe taxes on stuff developed by the United States or, you know, who or from the science that was funded by the U.S. and, you know, a, a more free ball in industry <laughs> and and some transparency rules. Exactly. And I think that's the point right there is like it brings us right back into uh, government corruption and and money in politics and lobbyists and influence. And it all goes right back to these units could collaborate, the government could set the rules, the companies could set their, their levels of, of what they need to actually be able to, to profitably uh, survive as a company, and it could work collaboratively together, except that you have too much co corruption. So you have the politicians who want to get their, their donations so that they can re get reelected, and to do so, they're going to make some agreements that this company then can make a little bit more money here and there and not have to adhere to these uh, rules that are uh, that are into this. And so that's that's our biggest challenge as Americans to our democracy is finding a way to cleanse our processes to get back to the the, the core of and, and that's where that's where electing progressive, uh, honest, transparent people at the lowest levels start. You, your dog catchers, your county people, your counselor, you know, everybody from the bottom up, because everybody knows the powers does not come from the top down. Mm -hmm. It comes from the people at the bottom. And if we continue to put people in place who can make that progressive and positive change, then we will eventually see it to the top. But during that process, we have to be aware that some people will drink the Kool-Aid on their way up and they will become corrupt and they will lose their way and we'll have to vote them out. But eventually those waves will get will reach the top where the highest echelons will finally achieve a level of beauty and, and value that we all will share as, as Americans and, and as Americans. Thank you. I, I think you should uh, say that 
every time you open your mouth, like every time you go somewhere that that was beautifully <laughs> said. I agree. Um, it's hard to go on after that. I feel like that's cut. But <laughs> um, space exploration slash NASA. This wasn't a space force question. It's become a space force question. <laughs> but uh, uh, so not to not to keep industry from doing their own. But should we maintain spe space exploration and maybe make rules about space exploration? I, I'm a supporter of space exploration, not because it's efficient, which it incredibly is not efficient. It doesn't really, I mean, we learn a lot in science because of it, and it, and it does help, uh, you know, advance some, uh, some medical and some experimental thing. But really, the only reason I'm a supporter of NASA and of space exploration is because it swells the hearts of the youth and it allows them to dream bigger and want to be involved. So not everybody is gonna be an astronaut, but everybody who's inspired might be a doctor, they might be a chemist, they might be a rocket scientist. And the more kids we can get inspired with knowledge, the greater our country will be. It's those who believe that they don't need a, a, further, a furthering of their education, a, 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 a venue to force themselves out of their shells and to, and to uh, try a little bit harder to have a greater understanding. If, if we don't get out of these boxes, then we will far, we'll find ourselves farther and farther down the, the rat hole of, of uh, uh, you know, closed-mindedness and, and the inability to see outside our own tunnel vision. And so just the value we put into inspiring those children to be more is why I support all kinds of scientific uh, investment. Wonderful, thank you. Um, <clears throat> The next one is libraries. Yep, I love libraries. They're good. <laughs> so we should maintain our public library. Excellent. Yeah. Definitely. We should be able to just. Definitely. I mean, we have to keep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, I, we have to we have to continue to invest in them and make them more and more user friendly because uh, you know you should be able to just log on to an app to your local public library and click on a book you want to read. And it would be great because everybody reads Kindle or they have access through their smartphones and everything. So it should just, you know, you click on Vancouver Public uh, Library, click on the app, bring up the books or the, or the interests you have, bring it up and read it. And that's, and that's, it still needs to be a building so that people in the community have that for, you know, for those who don't have internet, for those who don't have a Kindle, for those who just need to meet together and have coffee and talk about books. It needs to be a, a physical location, but we also need to make sure that we're advancing with technology and that it's user friendly. I love that. It, Tacoma is losing libraries. So that's part of, you know, it, it depends on where you're at, I think, as to how strong a response you have to that question. <laughs> Right. Well, earlier we had a candidate who that's where they do all their main stuff. I mean, they're rural as well. That's like their community yeah. center. Yeah, it's the only place with a meeting room. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the paranoid guy inside me says, well, what happens when technology is destroyed by some kind of internet bug yep. and they have our physical books? That's you right. know, where, who holds those? Is it going to be like Alexandria? We lose all of our knowledge and so we're left behind another thousand years? Oh, you just tapped on like the most heartbreak I have over any historic uh, thing, well, historic event. It, I think the most tragic thing in history um, is the burning of the library in Alexandria. So thank you, sir. Yeah. I wish I could vote for you. Uh, so, but <laughs> next on our list is um, community housing, uh, especially for those who are mm -hmm. um, in like uh, in need or people who are aging out of the homes they've owned and need different accommodations, um, privatized, uh, socialized combos. Yep, uh, Clark County has a commission on aging. And one of the things that they really are focused on is aging in place and helping uh, people who are uh, getting taxed out of their houses because their house when they bought it was 50,000 and now it's $550,000 in assessed value. So their taxes are more than they've made and way more than their, than their retirement. So that's one aspect that they're looking into. Another one is just aging in place and then being able to utilize the house that they have. So it was two stories when they bought it, 
now they can't walk so good. So they've got to be able to modify the home so they can stay where they're comfortable and not have to move somewhere else. And then the other part of it is the infrastructure to be able to get from a rural home to the doctors uh, uh, in, in without taking three cabs, two buses, and an Uber to get there. So, and those are all the aspects that Clark County is looking at right now with the Commission on Aging. And those are the recommendations that come to the council for, uh, for a, a vote, an advisory vote, or to set ordinances. And I don't believe that the people that we have in place right now have as much value on our elders as they do on the real estate agents. Oh, yeah. I feel like the challenge in Tacoma when we talk about housing solutions for our homelessness problem, we've got realtors who are like leading the charge. Um, I, I question um, having profit makers involved with the decision makings of people who are in need of service. So yeah. all right, I got, I'll get off the soapbox. Um, you already spoke about elections, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then legal services beyond a public defender. Um, you know, I, I think uh, someone told us recently that 60% of people who go to court, um, be it for divorce or um, other reasons, like, uh, that they don't have the ability to legal, uh, have, have legal service. So expanding and uh, the legal service is the idea being suggestion. suggestion. Yeah. Uh, so in Clark County of our $897 million budget, about $435 million of that is the incarceration uh, machine, your sheriff's department, your courts, uh, your legal defenders, and the, uh, and the jail facility. And uh, it's a huge, it's a huge amount of our budget. Uh, we definitely need to do more for providing services for those who, who can't provide it themselves. And so we need to invest in that as, as a community and make sure that all of those among us are equitable in their, uh, their access to getting fair representation. But we also need to inspire and, and um, help those legal providers to also benefit from being a part of the system, offering pro bono access or discounted services. And by doing that, they get some kind of a rebate on their taxes or uh, some kind of a, pro, a, a something that we can do to, to say thank you to all of the great attorneys out there who can provide their services for a lot less. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, first responders, should we have private first responders privatized? <laughs> No, I, I think uh, we need, definitely need to have that as a public service. Our, uh, our, um, our police officers are public in their union. Our firefighters are public in their union. Our emergency response vehicles are privatized and they pay their, their employees almost nothing. Uh, they keep these, these guys on 24-hour uh, service at $12 an hour and you can't get the best quality care especially with something that's so vital as, as I, I'm CPR uh, a certified instructor. And so I know that nothing is more important than what happens to the a person uh, in an emergency within the very first minutes, it, whether it's, it's giving CPR or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, getting them to move around or whatever, it, it, stopping the blood flow, whatever it, it takes for their particular uh, emergency has to happen within the first few minutes. And when you have somebody who's been up for 24 hours and is getting paid $11 an hour and might have some stressful stuff going on at home, you're not getting the same quality of service as you would by a county provide, uh, provided service where you have professionals making 60, 70, $80,000 a year who are getting adequate time off and who have all of the investment to make sure that their training was as thorough and, and uh, professional as it should be. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this last one, is an idea that we're play, playing with. So there's no model for it. There's no uh, breakdown of how we're gonna pay for it. Uh, and everything's, you know, it's a sketch, but it's called the caregiver's basic income. So if you're raising a child or children under the age of eight, if you're caring for someone who's disabled or aging uh, and uh, so that you don't have to balance all, your, all, all the familial or um, caregiving uh, needs with your job or jobs, that you get a caregiver's basic income, and that it goes to cre it credits your social security, so as to not leave you mm -hmm. with a gape in your in your earn earnings. So, um, right. what do you say about that, Mister? 
Well, it sure sounds a lot like the Nordic countries that have a basic universal income. And so they provide a base source of, for, of income for everybody. And then those who go through education and get good paying jobs, they pay back into society for that. And they help carry the weight for those who then are raising families, building a strong village, building a strong society, going and getting a great education so that when they come out, they make that investment back into society also. And I think it's a fantastic idea. I don't think it encourages people just to sit around and not doing anything because there's requirements. You can't just sit home. You've got to be going to school. You've got to be raising a family or you've got to have a, a serious uh, disability that doesn't allow you to participate. So, you know, I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's way, the, the way you build a, the great society is by investing in the least among us to lift them because when they rise, we all rise together. So I definitely support it. I think it's a fantastic idea. And I, I'm, I'm not an economist, but I know there are ways that, that countries can do it and they are doing it. Excellent, thank you. And so that concludes the list, uh, but I do have a question uh, regarding Clark County. Are, so usually elections are staggered. So not all, what, seven members of the council are up, but uh, so how many are up for, five? Ooh, that's a well, big year. Um, we, we, have, we have five total. Oh, we even have five, not five are up for election. Okay. Correct. Uh, and then are, are, is, are there any other progressive challengers no. to anybody else run to anybody else for election? No. Oh. So, so, so we have you'll five. be alone. alone. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, sorry. I, I lost my internet today for the, of the entire community. We don't have internet today, so I'm just accessing off my phone. So it's a little bit shaky, but um, so we have five seats total on our council. We have four districts that are represented by a, an elected uh, member. And then we have the chair, which is an at-large position that I'm running for. Uh, right now we have three of the five seats that are up, uh, district one, district two, and the at-large chair. Uh, in District 1, we have uh, two Democrats and a Republican and maybe somebody else, and I'm not sure if they, they were like a social workers party or I, don't, I wouldn't want to say workers fa working families party. I can't remember exactly who they are, I, but I, I've not, I haven't talked to them. So they haven't come into any community events. They haven't shown up to anything. District 2 has two Republicans running, and then the chair seat that I'm running for has four people running total. One of them is a very, very right-wing uh, Trump supporter. One of it is a moderate to right uh, conservative Trump supporter. There's me, and then there is uh, uh, a lady who I, I'm not sure what she, she, her claim is that she's a, a blue dog Democrat, um, but you're, you're welcome to, to look her up. Christy Stanley is her name. She, she owns cannabis stores throughout uh, Washington. She's a really nice lady. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that she's invested in this county other than just to try to get her pot store open, which I think is it's an admiral. You know, I support lifting the moratorium on cannabis. So I get where she's coming from. I think it's great. And I would support her in that. Uh, and that's that's who in the, who's in the race. So right now I'm uh, all of our numbers look fantastic. We're, we're raising money really well. Uh, definitely not keeping up with those Republicans, but I'm not expecting to because we've got the, the people power who will get us through uh, the primary. Um, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's been really exciting and I'm really excited for these next uh, 20 days to get through the primary. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Clark County, um, the unincorporated, is it just, just unincorporated that's not able to sell marijuana or is it the, yeah, it's unincorporated, right? Unincorporated. It's not, yeah. not able to. So there's only specific areas in some cities. Um, that are able to have stores. So it's been a big fight within the area. Um, so just to let you guys know about that. Especially, uh, just to clarify, uh, Clark County is the highest revenue source for taxes on cannabis in the entire state of Washington. And the, and the county of Clark is not getting any of that. It's all going to the cities. So it's completely, when we're coming up against a budget shortfall in the next few years on, on, on uh, you know, we're going to have to cut services, we're going to have to cut uh, benefits. When we could just lift the moratorium and close some of that gap by revenue on, on, on cannabis sales, it's completely ridiculous. Not to mention not having that access for people who are terminal 
or or just a, a, a being able to provide a better quality of life for people who need cannabis to make their life a little bit better, whether it's mental health or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, terminal cancer or anything else, having that access to them so they don't have to take a bus all the way to Vancouver is a service we should be providing. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a more aspect. A, a, and the biggest thing is the people of Washington voted for it overwhelmingly to legalize cannabis retail sales. Why are we holding it back as a county? We're, we look, we look uh, a little backwards and it's kind of embarrassing. It really is, especially the revenue that we could be bringing in. It, it's, it's really insane. Um, Tyler, are you available to talk or are you just listening in? If he's able to talk, he'll pop right in. All right, we'll wait for him to, to stick in because I wanted to have him uh, talk about or have him present for one of the discussions. Oh, there he is. So in your, um, so we're going to be talking about article the first real quick. Um, and uh Eric does know about it, but he's saying that um, he supports it, but he says it would need to be ratified first. And this is where I wanted you to come in because it has been ratified. Um, we, uh, it's just in the Supreme Court's fighting that now. So I just want to know if you wanted to speak on anything like that, Tyler, or not while we have you. Yeah, well, the, the evidence is clear that it was indeed ratified actually twice in, in history. That was not known. The, the, the evidence wasn't all compiled in one place at the same time until now. So it's not, um, that's what the lawsuit is about. The lawsuit is, is bringing to the table the fact that all of the evidence is compiled and that did actually happen, not just once but twice. What do you and, think and, about and, that, Eric? <laughs> if the Supreme Court supports it, then then I'm, I'm behind it. I just, I, I look at it from the aspect that we've got a lot of people who are about to lose a lot of power and I can't see it actually happening. I support it, but I can't, I, I have a hard time believing it'll actually get through. I mean, it, it, it's the same thing with money in politics. I, yeah, I, that's the issue. Yeah. Right, but it would be a very good swift thing for the people to become yeah, <laughs> involved. <laughs> Uh, do you have any questions at all? Why would have you, Tyler? If we could somehow get it to be actual. Uh, no, I'm good. I've, I've just been paying attention and listening. Um, I, th I think I have, all of my questions actually got asked and answered uh, since I've been on. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so another thing I saw in your form that you filled out, I really liked um, <laughs> part of your, your gun response. Um, so uh, this is a, I want to read it because I was just like, yeah. Um, so it says, I support the individual privilege to, to own a, actually, I won't even, you talk about guns. I like the way you put this here. <laughs> and well, I want, I mean, and how people are armed. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, just like Tyler was saying about the Supreme Court, this is something that's going to have to go before and get a clear definition of what the right to bear arms is, because uh, you would have to find a clear definition on, on, and I even heard a person earlier saying that we have a right to pursue happiness, but not a guarantee thereof. So we have a right to bear arms, but not the guarantee thereof, if they want to twist it that way. It was a conservative person who, who, uh, who used that to say that we shouldn't be getting health care, that we should not be getting education, that we should not be getting all of this stuff, that you should have access to it, but it is not guaranteed. I put the same argument on guns. You should have access to them, but that right is not guaranteed. It's a privilege, and it should be treated as such. Uh, what I liked in one of your last pieces here, uh, the terms arms need to be clarified. As I see the freedom of all Americans to vote as a right of the people to keep and bear arms. An educated American is armed with knowledge. Therefore, we all have a right to uni university education, no matter what the ability to pay for it. I just like the way that you brought those two together. If you want to write for that, you know, we have a right to, to knowledge as well. So yeah. I just thought that was great. Thanks. Um, and then down in Clark County, um, uh, I know that, uh, and I know you're a big advocate, you've been very verbal about it, about our marginalized communities um, and things like that. And it's been gearing up even more and more there and more white supremacy and stuff. Can you kind of go into that and how you think that um, as a county counselor, you can maybe help shape some changes in that uh, in a better direction? Well, I, I mean, frankly, uh, nationalism and patriotism are two completely different spectrums of being an American. And I'm all for people who want to wave the flag and, and uh, love America and serve our country. 
all the more power to you. I think it's fantastic to be a participant in, in the democracy in any format you want. But once you start engaging in hate practices and you're engaging in nationalism where you start to become blind to the realities of our history and start to uh, uh, try to force that, that nationalism down other people's throat, it's, that's where you're, you are crossing that line into what is not acceptable in our society. And uh, patriotic Americans are those of us who are willing to challenge our government and willing to challenge our elected officials, even when they're in our own party. It's, that's a patriot, somebody who will stand up and challenge the status quo because it is not equitable for everybody in those marginalized uh, situations. A nationalist is somebody who believes that we can do no law wrong, that we never have done any wrong, and that there are some of us who are destined to be better than others. And that's something that has to be stamped out. It is not an acceptable part of our freedoms. It is not protected under the First Amendment. And, uh, and we need to make sure that, that we do everything we can to make sure that everyone has a voice when that voice speaks well of all. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions uh, for Eric before I keep going? That looks good. Um, uh, one thing I always like to ask everybody is, you know, because I like to see how involved they are in their, in their community. Um, and I've seen you out there, but not everybody has. So you want to talk about just kind of different things that you've done within your community, any volunteer work or anything that, um, you know, stands out? Uh, I mean, we, we do what we can with, uh, with uh, uh, our, our boys are in Boy Scouts, so we volunteer to help uh, clean up parks and stuff like that. I've been a Freemason for many, many years, so we volunteer to, uh, to donate. And, you know, the, uh, the Shriners are one of the largest philanthropic organizations of child uh, health care, providing hospitals, nonprofit uh, access for children. Um, and then just being, you know, you know, my wife is, is a big supporter of trails and of, of wolf conservancy. So we, we do our share of, of uh, I mean, we can always do more. And uh, that's what running for office is for me is, is trying to provide more of a, of a fair access for those who are, who don't have access or the voice that, that the wealthy do on our, on our commissions. Beautiful, thank you. Um, okay, so finally, we're gonna have you go ahead and state your name again, what position you're running for, any good, sh oh, Courtney, did you have your hand raised? Yeah? No. Oh, no, I'm good. No, go ahead, ask yeah, a question. Sorry. We haven't gotten there yet, so you, you jumped in just in time. Okay, all right, well, you, ha you have a farm, as I understand, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you were familiar with permaculture, and if you utilize <laughs> any uh, non, like uh, non-traditional in the sense of American agriculture, but maybe traditional in the sense of how farming has been done over time. Any, you know, right. what techniques do you use? Well, we have uh, a non-conventional farm here. Uh, we're not we're not uh, rated because we didn't pay the fee, so we're not rated organic. But we don't uh, add anything unnatural. Uh, the only fertilizer that goes on our garden is from our cow and goats and chickens. Um, but uh, as far as permaculture, my wife is a certified permaculture design from, uh, from Oregon State University. So we catch water. We, uh, we are working on expanding our solar power. We do everything with the cycles as they are meant to do. And we allow the nature to set the course for us rather than trying to fight it. Wonderful. That's, I, I'm, it just makes me so happy when the person I talk to says, yes, my spouse is doing permaculture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I feel so lucky to say, you're not the first person. So yes. well, I, we're building a crowd. <laughs> my wife is, is much more talented than I am. So I lean on her heavy for all of her gifts. Excellent, I'll vote for her next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank That's you. That's awesome. Oh, that might have made your day. I saw you light up as soon as you heard about that. All right, so let's do this again. So um, okay. anybody else real quick? No? All right. So yeah, state your name, state, you know, the office, you know, give a little blurb uh, where people can find you and how they can help, you know, some things that you might need uh, people to help out with. Okay, so I'm Eric Holt. I am running for the Clark County Council Chair, and I'm running to bring... Uh, leadership first and foremost because you really can't get anything else done 
in, in leadership. Everybody wants to start off with infrastructure, jobs. I'm going to build everybody a house. I want to do this. Really, you need effective leadership because nothing gets done without it. And right now we don't have leadership. Um, so if you want to help, you can go to erickholt.com and you can volunteer, you can donate, you can endorse just because you believe in me and, and that helps. If you live in Clark County, first and foremost, what I need you to do is vote and then make sure everybody in your family and your friends and your neighborhood vote because that's how our voices are heard. If you do live in Clark County or if you come here often, you can volunteer, sign wave, knock on doors, make phone calls. All of that helps us get our message out without spending the vast amount of money that our uh, opponents are going to be spending. And if you do have five or ten dollars that you can uh, you can give just to help us get some of the lit out to get some of the, the signs printed, then that would be great. And you can give that on the erickholt.com website also. Oops, muted myself. Um, beautiful. And just to remind everybody out there too is that now our um, uh, they come postage, postage paid, so you don't have to wait to go yeah. buy stamps. You get, <laughs> you can just put it right in the mailbox um, and and not have to worry about that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead, uh, Eric. Thank you uh, so much for taking the time out. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, end this live stream here real quick. And thank you everybody for uh, stopping in and watching and asking questions. And we'll see you next time.